going to be looking at history of the Roman Empire, and I'm going to be swapping uh, the camera around a little bit and doing some cuts, so I'm just m wanting to show an initial thing. My history with this game is kind of interesting. This is one I picked up before I got uh, involved on Board Game Geek, but just as, or just as I was starting to get back into, hey, you know, there's some cool games available. This was in the GMT bargain bin. Even though it's not a GMT game per se, it's a, a Udo Grab Games. Uh, the, and was printed. Usually they don't reduce the price on uh, these other games that they, they bring into play, but nobody was picking this one up. Uh, my impression back when I played it, and I only played it once or twice, was, hey, this is better than the game it's based off of, which I think I have kicking around somewhere, but not here, not on my shelves. It's hidden over here. History of the World, the old Avalon Hill game. History of the World always kind of pissed me off in some ways just because it was so inaccurate in terms of what kind of uh, uh, happened based on it. Whereas this one followed, you know, because of the more limited space or whatever, more believable pathways for the players. And we'll see how it does that. Um, one thing that's painful though, you know, there's a couple painful things I'm noticing right away that I want to point out. One is the rule book is nowhere near as easy to cope with as History of the Worlds. And it's funny because there's not a lot more difficult concepts in this, but I'm going to have to poly uh, push through that a little bit before I come back to you with that. Another is one of the setup factors. If you remember, History of the World has, uh, you know, a number of different decks. I think uh, it has decks for the different eras. Uh, for the different uh, player powers. That's not going to be handled by decks on this. That's going to be handled using these tokens. That's fine. It's a, just a different means of doing the same thing. Uh, it, the charts relate to some tokens that I haven't set up yet. But you also have player cards that are kind of powers that you can play during, you know, to give you some special advantage. And in History of the World, you get one from each deck, basically and the decks are sorted and they have different backs. Well, here all the decks have the same back and they're differentiated by these color codes. And of course, when I pull out a deck of cards, the first thing I do is shuffle it. So even if I had it sorted, it, I had to go through a sorting process. The sorting process ain't easy. If you have any difficulty distinguishing colors, this is hellish. Um, so these, yeah, I can tell them apart, but I know there are people who can't tell that kind of color differentiation apart. The one that was hell for me was these two. I just put them in the same stack. I can't tell any difference between them. The key for me, all of these are kingdom cards, and I know enough about history of the world to know all the kingdom cards are sort of one set. So that's gonna be the same here. Now, we got another set of kingdom cards here though. Uh, as well. So you're going to get, by, by dealing these out this way, uh, both this game and History of the World, ensure that you get a fair uh, assortment of cards. Now I think that's the original History of the World. I think the copy that I have doesn't give you that. I, I'm not so sure. Um, I think they have all singular backed cards and they're all kind of more balanced rather than, hey, this is, you know, this is your important kingdom card, this will make you points, this one is a good combat card that you have, so you want that. Uh, I think they rebalanced the game by trying to make all the cards kind of equally valuable. I'm, I'm not sure though, I'll have to pull that out. I have the second edition of Avalon Hills version of it, and I'm really unhappy with the stupid plastic pieces and everything. Anyway, this one not only feels more like the original uh, history of the world, but it actually betters it in terms of the historical accuracy. And we'll see uh, some of that in a minute. But I, I do want to be able to give you some kind of idea of what the rules are like because they are a pain in the ass to cope with. And there are some significant differences from how history of the world handles things, even if the core mechanisms are uh, ones you'll recognize. As we bring the game into focus here. Okay. So I've set up the game now. Each player gets a selection of their pieces. There's, it only holds four players. Uh, I put these guys out here just for ease of access. It doesn't really matter if they're on there or not. Uh, a little bit of sorting here, not much. These are all the kingdoms. Not all of them will be in play. And each player gets one card off of each of one of those colored ducks. So you're going to have one of each color. And that's kind of the way of balancing things out a little bit because some of them are of interest. Now, 
The actual play of the game is a little different in a key aspect or two from uh, History of the World. For one thing, you're playing two powers at once on each turn. You're going to be playing a Roman faction, which actually remains stable throughout the game, but your leader and the benefits that you get for that faction change as you go. So you're going to keep the same pieces on the board, but who you're you know, sort of royal leader is, or whatever, is going to be modified based on that and how, how you favor your faction. And you'll see it's not just the Imperial Era. We get some of the late Republic here as well, but then we continue on to the very end of the Empire with Romulus Augustus. The different barbarian tribes that come out, they're going to be assigned in a manner similar to uh, History of the World, where how this is going to work is you're going to uh, shuffle these chits into a cup. I'll grab a cup. This one works. And you draw one. The first player draws one, and he has the choice of either keeping it or passing it to someone who doesn't have a chit yet. Likewise, uh, that's going to go around in whatever the player order is. Now, that player order is determined differently. Um, on the first turn, it's going to be random, and what I'm going to use is my setup order, yellow, green, blue, red. I go counterclockwise. Don't worry about that. You'll get used to it. Uh, it causes problems in some games, but it won't in this. Um, and then you repeat the same process with the barbarians. I believe that's the order you do it in. I'll switch the cards if it's not. And um, the barbarians are going to start on the board and expand rather like a normal uh, history of the world power. I'll go into more detail as, as I go along, but if you haven't, you know, if you've seen history of the world, that should give you a, a pretty good idea of how it's going to run. So you're going to be running uh, an imperial uh, Roman faction which you're going to be scoring points from. And at the same time, or on the same turn, you're going to be running a barbarian faction which can harass the other player's Roman factions. The Roman factions are more important because they carry over and you keep getting the ability to do things with them. Uh, whereas the barbarians generally don't get to go again. And if they do, they may not be you. Uh, someone gets it at random, it, well, in that semi-random fashion with the passing of chits again. So if they're in a strong position, Whoever gets the first chit will take them. If they're in a weak position, they'll probably pass it to whoever they think they can hurt the most with it. And scoring is going to be done in part with a chart like in History of the World, this diocese victory point table. Each of your powers, the Roman and the barbarian, uh, well, the Roman faction and the barbarian and kingdoms that you control, all the past barbarians, all the kingdoms, whatever you've, you've got under your control, I'll end up scoring together on these. And you get a multiplier as you would in History of the World uh, for, uh, you know, you get one, one times the value if you just are present in the region, twice if you have kind of a dominating position, and three times if you absolutely control it, um, which is ho holding everything in it. Uh, the sequence of play is going to be, you know, I think barbarians are drawn first, the way this is worded. Uh, it looks like it. So I'll just swap those. The sequence of play is going to be the players draw a barbarian first. Um, and then, and, and go through that process of handing them off. And then they do the same with the emperors for each given era. So each era has its own sequence. And the token that you draw will correspond with one of these tokens uh, so that you don't need a card for each empire. Whereas the rest of the information is reproduced on the chart, you know, six on one hand, half a dozen on the other, right? Uh, then you carry out uh, your player phases. Now, I believe what happens is all the barbarians go first. No. You alternate back and forth. So the first barbarian in sequence gets to go first. If there's no Gauls on the first set, then you go to the Swebby or whatever. So what happens is you say, hey, you know, does anybody have 
Token one, the Gauls. Uh, yeah, I do. Well, you take your turn. If not, you, you move down to the Suebi, to the Garamonts, whatever. Uh, there's going to be four of them in each phase, though, and there's only five options available, so <laughs> you'll only be skipping one uh, each time in the four-player game. And generally, it's a four-player game. So the two-player game is split it into two, uh, two groups that, uh, of two players each, like you get to play two different players at the same time. The three-player game modifies things a little bit. It takes one of the legions away from each player because there'll be less of a barbarian threat in that. Um, and then the first emperor token is revealed, and they get their turn. And then the second barbarian and the second emperor. Um, during your player phase, the first thing you get to do is play your event cards from here. And is there a limit? In the old game, in the original game, you're only allowed to play two. Yeah, you're only allowed to play two event cards per game turn, and no more than one on any given player phase. So you're only allowed to play one for any uh, any given power, either the barbarian or the emperor. And it takes effect at, during this stage, although it may have a lingering effect. For example, there's some that give you military advantages, etc. Then you're allowed to build your new armies. Place If you're an established power on the board, we'll see how that works. That's going to be a little different. Then you place your forces. Um, expansion is, in general, going to work like in history of the world. You start in one area if you're a barbarian listed here. So, for example, the galleys start in Lugdunesis. They would get a piece there, and then they get to spread out from there. And if they end up in a space where they have to fight, well, they use the combat rules and then can continue expanding after that combat has been fully resolved, i.e. they either withdraw from the combat and stop wasting pieces on it, or they take the space, or they run out of pieces. Okay, then the Romans have this special build cities capability, which is a way of them stocking up victory points for later. And then whatever power you're playing at that point scores its victory points. And then you go to the next power in the order. So if it was a barbarian, it goes to an, uh, a Roman faction. If it was a Roman, it goes to the next barbarian in order. Okay. Um, over on these charts. So the barbarian chart tells you the name of the barbarian faction, how many pieces it has available, where it starts. And that's pretty much all that matters for them. For the Romans, uh, let's see. You get some special abilities here. So you have the name, you have a little coin to show you who it is. Uh, and then you have some bonuses here. So for example, this one wins ties in combat and has plus one legion that he generates at the beginning of the game. And we'll go over what those advantages are but pretty much it's going to be something you look at, at at the moment when you're drawing the chit and deciding how valuable a given emperor is, is you're comparing what their abilities are. Note that they don't give you uh, a number of strength, a number of pieces on the board. That's going to be something different. Now, did I miss something in starting the game? It wouldn't be shocking. Some event cards are going to have a period specified or a range of periods and they can only be played on those uh, time periods. Hopefully the way the decks are constructed, you will not be stuck with a, ah oh, geez, I have three period one cards and I, I have no chance to play them. You may end up getting yourself boxed into that situation by not playing cleverly <coughs> if you have uh, uh, cards with a range on them, but you should never be forced into that, so you should be able uh, to help yourself with that. I know in history of the world you're not forced to. I'm hoping here it's the same. Some cards are kingdoms and tribes. When a kingdom and, or tribe comes on the board, that's going to be played as an individual little power. Immediately during the event card phase, you get to spread out like it's a barbarian and play it. Um... 
From then on, they're not going to do anything for you in the game, except they will score points as barbarians do. And they will always be under your control. You have two of these in each person's hand. Uh, vacant provinces. Cities are not affected by epidemic, pestilence, or plague. Should all armies in a province be wiped out, the province can be claimed without conquest by placing an army into it. Um, okay. So, if you're a Roman, you can create new armies uh, by building them, and the barbarians get to build new ones, too. Barbarians don't build new armies. Okay, great. Uh, if this is a particular people's first appearance in the play, you get your entire stack of units, as indicated over there on the chart. If the barbarians are already in play, you get to fill it up, so you get all your counters back in the next period that they show up. Now. It may not be the same person who ran them before, though, and that's kind of the, that's an interesting factor in this, in terms of the choices of who's going to take what barbarian. So if you've already got a barbarian on the board, there's a chance that they can be taken away from you if someone else gets them as their chip. <coughs> that's very different from history of the world, where if you have, you know, whatever force that you put on the board stays yours throughout all the eras of the game. Uh, even though you never really get to use them again. Okay. For Romans, each Roman faction is going to start the game with seven tokens, uh, seven legions that they can spread out with. Plus, if they have any bonus legions uh, and a fort. Plus, they'll get... Uh, bonus legions. Now the Romans can recruit legions starting on the second turn and they can bribe rebels and build forts or fortresses. For recruiting legions, the first three turns it's going to cost two Roman victory points to recruit legions. I don't think you're allowed to on this first turn. Uh, from the fourth game turn on, the cost becomes three Roman victory points per legion. If any of your legions are rebelling, they're not eliminated uh, so you can't rebuild them. They're out of your force pool. And they're going to be sitting there on the board with a little rebel marker. Unless somebody buys them off and takes them over. Which could be you. Uh, you can bribe any Roman faction's rebel legions by paying two victory points per legion. This just goes away. Uh, and you get one of your own legions on the board for it. So it's a somewhat cheaper way to uh, uh, recruit legions, basically. And you get to recruit them in a specific location that might be out of your normal range. Okay. Forts and fortresses. You can build these for one victory point. Uh, forts for one victory point. They can only be placed in a, a province controlled by that faction. You can only put one fort in each province. These are your fort markers. No, these are cities. These are your fort markers. These are your fortress markers. They look rather colorful. You can upgrade a fort to a fortress for another Roman victory point each, but you can't do it all at once. And you can only build a fortress in a province that has a city. Not just a site, but an actual city. Um, provinces can hold a maximum of three armies. Yeah, <laughs> if you're used to history of the world, you know, that's usually not really a big concern. Usually things are spread out. There's one or two at most somewhere, but that is important for retreats, perhaps. Um, and one fort or fortress, in addition to an attacking enemy army that's temporarily there. Uh, each province containing a city site may have a city in it as well. Okay, if there were no barbarians of this particular barbarian people at the start of the game turn, they get placed in the barbarian starting province. If there's any armies there, they're going to have to retreat to an adjacent friendly province or be eliminated. Uh, any fort or fortress present in the starting province will be eliminated as well. Uh, 
If the Barbarian started the game turn on the map, the active player can use any number of his Barbarian armies already on the map at the start of his phase for expansion. He just picks them up off the map to leave the vacated provinces uncontrolled and he can re-expand. And he can just go back into them because they're empty, assuming they connect back to his home area. Uh, you place new Barbarian armies one at a time in any province in which you already have Barbarians, a province adjacent to your starting province, or an adjacent uh, province adjacent to a province already occupied by your people. <clears throat> the first Roman uh, each player starts his Roman faction phase by placing one of his legions and a city in one of the following provinces, Aquitania, Rome, uh, Achaea, and Syria. And that'll give you kind of a nice uh, spread. I'm a little bit iffy about Aquitania at this point, although there certainly is part of this under Roman control, but some of that's not really under Roman control. Uh, but I think that, I think basically this would be a more reasonable city site and starting location, but for obvious uh, uh, balance purposes, not having Rome so close here seems wise. Uh, the active player then places his new units um, in a Roman faction one at a time in a province in which he already has his armies or a province adjacent to a province he has his armies in. So you start the game on the board coming in with a legion and a city counter, and then you get to spread out from there just like you were uh, barbarians. So you get to kind of define the early, uh, the shape of the republic. You could throw it out into Britannia or something if you so desire. Um, Roman factions can expand across seas except for the Mare Caspian. Uh, without a problem. If they move this way into a province containing enemy Roman factions or kingdoms, the defender gets the difficult terrain pro uh, bonus. If the province is barbarian or tribe controlled, the defender not only gets the difficult terrain bonus, but also a plus one modifier to their die rolls. After you expand your Romans, you're allowed to build a city for every pair of city site that you have. Cities must be placed in provinces with city sites controlled by the active player and may not contain another city. Uh, this must be your starting province if possible. Well, they already start with a city, so it's just a, if you're still in your starting province, you have to rebuild it. If no sites are available to the faction, no new cities can be built. Also note that a player may only have one city on the map per pair of city sites. Now that wording bothers me for a number of reasons. One is Rome had lots of cities. Another is it doesn't really mesh with what the building cities rule is. So the building cities rule says you can build a new city for every pair of these you have. And the question is, are there some additional implications there? And I'm gonna just say no, I'm gonna play it as you just have a limit of one per uh, two. Uh, yeah, that, I don't think there are any possible implications to that. I thought there were. It does bother me though that you can't have many cities, but there are some places like Dacia where there were, and Germania Magna where there were no cities, so that's okay. okay. Um, combat. Combat's going to work uh, in, in a fairly simple way. It works in rounds. After each round, uh, each player has an option to retreat. Uh, well, the defender has the option to retreat. The attacker always has the option not to keep coming. Um, so combat is basically as soon as you drop a, a token into an area that has an enemy token. So let's say... We had this situation. Green goes in here. That's going to be a combat situation. And the core to this is the attacker gets two dice, the defender gets one die, they roll. Uh, the defender wins ties, I believe. No, the attacker wins ties. Uh, and do, 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 do. you're trying to roll the single highest die roll. Now, there are things that give you bonuses to the dice, wins ties, things like that. 
Let's make sure I've got it right here. Uh, if you're attacking across a mountain or forest border, there's a difficult terrain benefit. And attackers using naval movement are using difficult terrain. And that means the defender is going to get to roll two dice, take the highest. Straits count as difficult terrain if you're crossing them. Armies can retreat across straits. Forts add one to the die roll made by the defending armies. A fortress adds one to the die rolls made by the defender, and they win all tied rolls. Oh, I'm sorry. Ties in this are re-rolls. Yeah, in the original history of the world, ties meant the defender won. I feel like this is a downgrade in terms of playability, if not, you know, any kind of accuracy or anything like that, because it means that you could continuously be rolling dice because you're always tying, especially since you're rolling maybe multiple dice, take the highest, the odds of getting different numbers starts going down as you do that. Um, if you want to attack a province with your own stuff, you can just say you defeated them. So if it's stuff you control, which includes a past kingdom or, or barbarian, uh, you can just succeed against it automatically. Right. <coughs> Rebellion and revolt. Um, these allow you to create a, units in another player's fact, uh, province. You don't get any difficult terrain advantage against the attacking rebels. Forts and fortresses, though, will still aid the defender. Now, I missed something about forts and fortresses here, which is they can be left alone in a province, in which case a Roman faction can just take them over for free and gains them. But a barbarian would have to attack the fort or fortress as if it has an extra strength point there. And in fact that happens if you kill off the Romans you still have to kill the fort or fortress. And that's to show that the Romans would have army versus army combat but uh, the populace outside would kind of defect to the winner rather than you know uh, be particularly aligned with one faction or another in a kind of cute sort of way, which I like. Um, when you end a player phase in a province that you didn't control at the start of the phase, the province is going to be conquered. Any city in that province is flipped over to its looted side, which is going to give you victory points. In general, the victory point is going to be a die roll of victory points that you just had. Now victory points are your goal for the game, but they're also how you rebuild your Roman faction. You have to spend Roman victory points to do so. Uh, Romans can't uh, loot other Roman control, uh, other Roman faction controlled cities when they take them. Ungarrisoned fort or fortress can be either com conquered or eliminated without uh, combat by Romans. Treachery, rebellion, and revolt are going to be also subject to these effects of conquest. Okay, if a Roman faction disappears, that's a bad thing for that player, a very bad thing. It's not such a big deal if you lose a barbarian faction because, hey, you know, yes, they would produce points for you, but you're not necessarily going to control it. It's not your big uh, control throughout the game. Losing a Roman faction is a big deal. Um... And if you get wiped off the map in terms of legions, but you still have any Roman victory points left, you can restart. And you can buy uh, one legion in a province with only a fort or fortress in it, in a vacant province adjacent to a Roman-controlled province, or in a Roman-controlled province, thus immediately attacking the army that's in it uh, as a revolt, essentially. If you have no more units in play and no victory points, you're dead and you're out for the rest of the game. You will only be able to get points off your barbarian factions from then on. You'll no longer be eligible to be an emperor. Um, and I think you just won't be involved in the draw for that anymore. Kingdoms and tribes get called into play by uh, event cards. Once they come in, like we said before, they get a little mini phase. They might have uh, kingdoms will have a city or, and a fort. 
and tribes are better at defending against attacks that use naval movement as they don't have a port. The victory in the game is going to be the addition of your barbarian and Roman victory points at the end of the game. Okay, so how do you accumulate those victory points other than looting? Well, you're going to get them at the end of whatever action you take. So if you take a barbarian turn, you're going to score the barbarian victory points at that point. If you take a Roman turn, you score your Roman victory points at the end of your turn there. Uh, the barbarian phase, you score two points for controlling a city in Rome. One point if it was looted when you took it, I guess. Because you must loot it immediately. Uh, one point for controlling any other city that wasn't looted when you went in. Do you have an option to loot? Is that what it is? Yeah, you have an option to loot. So you have the choice of flipping it for points or leaving it alive. Okay, so if you leave it alive, you get more points that way. Then you're going to get the points for diocese, which is as I explained a little earlier, but for those who aren't used to history of the world, let me go into it a little bit more. So, for example, here is the matching to this color diocese and you kind of have to do that color match across the board oh no they they say it here so this is africa this is arabia here unfortunately they're kind of close to each other in both color and location um so merely having a unit in that location gets you one times the value and these values change throughout the the game uh, although not as drastically as they do in history of the world if you have uh, let me find the diocese. If you have domination, which is control of at least three or four provinces, or more than any other control three or four provinces, or more than any other uh, player has in that diocese, you'll get double the victory points. This is a little different. In history of the world, you have to have th uh, you have to have more than any other player. That's all that matters. Here you have more options you could just be a major force in that area. Um, I don't know if the three or four guarantees that you have the majority though. It kind of looks like it did, does. Uh, and finally, control is to have every single province in that diocese and then you get triple the value here. And obviously, one thing that you learn in history of the world and you learn here, sometimes it's not best to focus in one area. But for long-term prospects, getting dominance in an area or control of an area where you have every single province makes it harder to drop you down below dominance. So you may actually be able to score more points over the long term. So there's a, a trade-off there that you have to kind of decide as you're going. Okay. And... Uh, starting turn four, you're going to get two points for controlling Thrace if it has a city in it, just as if it's Rome. Uh, this is the Constantinople uh, issue there. Okay. Um, when barbarians loot a city, the player gets a full die roll of victory points plus modifiers which may be listed on the kingdom cards. So for example, Egypt gives you a bonus when you loot them, when they exist as a kingdom. Once, they've, once Alexandria has been looted the first time, it just kind of becomes a regular city probably, unless there's some kind of weird rebirth. Um, looting a city in Rome or Thrace after turn four gives you two dice worth of victory points. So you, for short-term games, you certainly want to roll the dice. The question is whether you think you can stay there for a while, whether it's worth uh, holding on to it for those extra points as you go on. Because I don't believe that barbarians can rebuild cities. Okay, so going to the Romans now. At the end of a Roman faction phase, the player gets three points for controlling a city in Rome, two if it's looted, uh, and that, I believe, also goes to Thrace. Yeah, starting turn four. 
Two points for controlling any other city, one if it's looted. An emperor bonus for controlling provinces. Okay, let's see. For example, this guy gets plus a victory point for each province. Um, so does Tiberius here. Uh, actually, they have a whole series of people here. Some of them might have limits to the provinces they can get. I don't think so. It just looks like they have a bonus to getting provinces. So those are kind of cool emperors to get because they can score you more victory points. Um, you get your diocese points. Those are recorded separately for the Roman faction uh, than they are from the barbarians. So your barbarians could interfere with your Roman faction's points and vice versa. Something that's a little different. Now your barbarians is everything except your Roman faction, any kingdoms, anything like that. Uh, okay, if you loot a non-Roman city, you get a die roll versus victory points plus any modifier from the kingdom card. No bonus for Thracia or Rome. You probably can't loot them, but it might be possible. At the end of the game, you're going to get a bonus of two points per Roman-controlled province, and you roll victory points for each of your cities as if you were looting it. Uh, just to give you a bonus for not having looted, basically. Uh, so you do want to hold them if you think you can hold them till the end of the game. Okay, bribing barbarians. This is an optional rule, but I see no reason not to play it. If a Roman faction player is being attacked by barbarians, he can offer them some Roman victory points. If the barbarian accepts those victory points, he takes them, adds them to his own value, and is not allowed to attack that Roman faction for that game turn. The Barbarian has the right to refuse to take the victory points, though, and no one gets them then. Well, the Roman gets to keep them. That is about it. And we've got a nice uh, little summary of pretty much all the rules on here. It's not a tough game, but the rules aren't terribly well written. I've seen some people really griping about them. I don't think they're that bad, but i got to tell you this. Udo Grab... Uh, it tends to make his rules, from what I've seen, less accessible than most games. To make this simple a game difficult enough that some people who've played History of the World can't understand what's going on, that's troublesome. Because, uh, you know, this was not that hard a design to begin with. I know I looked at Assyrian Wars up here. That is one of the most poorly written uh, CDGs out there. It's pretty damn intriguing though, so go look at my videos of that. And I've looked at a couple of his magazine games as well, and they don't look well organized or, or well written at all. It's funny because his magazine actually has uh, some guy in it who basically writes an article every, every week, a, a paid article, complaining about how other companies write their games. And I'm like, don't even start. All right, let's send this up um, and we'll get started on it. This will be, the, again, this is, uh, these kind of games are kind of my comfort food type of games. I like them. They don't require a hell of a lot of thought and they, you know, they require some thinking, but the level I like for a Euro or for an AT type game, they don't require a whole hell of a lot in terms of rules understanding. If you screw something up, hey, so what? Uh, of course, that's true with just about everything except like, you know, a highly, highly competitive game. Uh, so let's send it up.